Hey, Creep Freaks, Ren here. Do me a favor. I'd really like to push over 400 subscribers with this video. So if you're listening and haven't subscribed, please hit that button for me. I'd really appreciate it. Now, let's get to tonight's story. The Horrifying Revenge of a Man Broken by Betrayal. Written in red by Ren Bryant. The sound of the shovel hitting the ground was like music to John's ears. He had been digging for hours, but he wasn't tired. In fact, he felt more alive than he had in years. The grave was almost finished, and he couldn't wait to fill it up. He paused for a moment, wiping the sweat from his forehead. He looked up at the moon, which was full and bright, illuminating the woods around him. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes, letting the cool night air fill his lungs. It had been ten years since the incident, ten years since his life had been turned upside down. Once, he was a successful businessman, with a beautiful wife and two children that he adored. It was the perfect nuclear family in the house with the white picket fence. His life was a Norman Rockwell painting. But, all of that had been taken away from him in one fell swoop. Well, one fell swoop maybe isn't the best way to put it. One large dick is probably more apt. On an unremarkable Tuesday evening, fate collided with John's mundane routine. He had been looking forward to Taco Tuesday, the weekly tradition he shared with his wife and kids. He entered the front door, walked up the steps to the bedroom to get changed out of his work clothes, and stopped short when he opened the bedroom door. There, in his marital bed, was a man the one with the large dick, plowing his wife. John's heart was pounding so hard in his chest he could hear the blood rushing through his ears. The sight before him was too much to bear. The anger and betrayal he felt were indescribable. How long had this been going on? Was this the first time, or was this merely the latest in a string of infidelities? He long suspected his wife Annette was cheating on him, but... To see her in the act sent him over the edge. John's world broke to pieces as he watched his wife writhe in pleasure beneath the weight of someone better looking than him. Her cries of ecstasy filled the room, mingling with the sound of flesh slapping against flesh. It was a scene straight out of a nightmare, and yet it was all too real. The man's body was a blur of tan skin and chisel muscles his dimpled ash cheeks flexed with each thrust. His well-manicured erection glistened with sweat, a sight that sent a surge of jealousy and disgust coursing through John's veins. He couldn't tear his eyes away, even though he wanted nothing more than to flee from the room and never look back. The man's head was buried between his wife's legs. The sound that emanated from her lips left no doubt as to how good the action was. John felt as though he was watching a train wreck in slow motion, powerless to stop it but unable to look away. His wife's moans grew louder, more frenzied, until they reached a fever pitch that made John's skin crawl. He felt sick to his stomach, but he still stayed rooted to his spot, unable to move. In that moment, John realized he didn't know his wife at all. The woman he had loved and trusted for so long was a stranger to him now, lost in a sea of passion and desire that had nothing to do with him. As he stood there, alone and helpless, he knew that he would never be able to unsee what he had witnessed. As he reached for the lamp on the dresser, his hand shook with fury. He knew what he was about to do was wrong, but he couldn't stop himself. He unplugged the lamp and crept towards the bed, the cord coiled tightly in his hand. The man fucking his wife was completely unaware of the danger that lurked behind him. John wrapped the cord around the man's neck, his fingers gripping it so tightly he could feel the pulse of the man's jugular vein. He pulled with all his might, feeling the man's struggle weaken as the oxygen was cut off from his brain. Annette's screams echoed throughout the room. She jumped out of bed, stumbled once, almost falling, 
but managed to catch herself. As she ran out the door, her blonde bob bounced wildly, a golden halo that framed her face. Her exposed breast jiggled in time with her frantic steps. The room was bathed in a sickly yellow light, the only sound a gurgling gasp of the dying man. When his face turned a gruesome tint of purple, John finally let go of the cord, his hands trembling with the force of what he had done. The silence that followed was deafening, broken only by the sounds of John's ragged breaths. He stared down at the lifeless body, his mind numb with shock and disbelief. The lamp lay discarded on the floor, its cord still wrapped tightly around the man's neck. Still amped with rage, John knew there was still one thing he had left to do. Cut off the man's penis and stuff it into his mouth. John did so and laughed, telling the home wrecker to eat this motherfucker. While he was strangling and cutting and stuffing, his wife had called the police. John was arrested and charged with murder without further incident. Annette didn't come to John's trial. She didn't visit him in prison either, nor allow the kids to see their old man, who was sentenced to life for his crime. John heard that Annette started a new life with a new husband and soccer and potluck dinners and making sure the kids forgot all about their real daddy who was sitting behind bars. The stuff with the kids was the worst. John loved his little ones, Amy and Paul. They were six and four when John got locked up. Six and four, playing downstairs while mommy got serviced by a stranger upstairs. They didn't deserve to be impacted by this like they were. Locked up, John had all sorts of time to himself. For ten years he spent all his days thinking about what had happened. But he wasn't thinking about his wife or the man he had killed. John was thinking about revenge. John spent countless hours in the prison library, reading books on anatomy and biology and chemistry. He had learned everything he could about the human body and how to cause pain and suffering without actually killing someone. When he could get his hands on contraband, he practiced on himself, cutting and burning his skin just to see how much pain he could take. And now he was free, released on parole for good behavior. It took John six months to track down his wife and her new lover, but that gave him all the time he needed to plan his revenge. He had rented a cabin in the woods, a secluded place surrounded by towering trees that loomed over the wooden structure. The cabin was nestled deep within the forest. The only sound that could be heard were the gentle rustle of leaves as the soft breeze blew through the trees. John had invited his wife and her new husband there, under the guise of reconciling. He didn't expect her to accept the invite and was surprised she did. He thought the long letter he drafted with the invite sealed the deal. It apologized for the things he had done and said how important it was for him to make amends, how his parole officer thought it was important. Annette and Fred had come, unsuspecting, and now the plan was for John to bury them alive. If he could, he would catch them having sex. That's how he imagined it in his head. It was his fantasy, something he dreamt about in his prison cot. His ex-wife spreading her legs while he walked in and killed them both. But even if he didn't catch them in the act, it'd be fine. They'd still end up dead. John was sure of it. It was just a matter of finding the right opportunity to strike. Dinner was awkward. John hadn't seen Annette in ten years and didn't think about how uneasy it would be sitting across from her again, especially with Fred alongside of her. John and Annette didn't remember how to speak to each other, what to say, or which topics were allowable. John tried to ask about the kids. He couldn't stand Annette, but thinking about the kids kept his mind free in prison. 
He wondered how tall they were, what they've done over the years, if they were dating anybody, if they missed him. Yo, Annette started to speak but shook her head and didn't finish the thought. I'll what? John said. His voice was more aggressive than he meant it to be. Annette shook her head again. N- never mind. John was concerned that something had happened to the kids, but Annette wouldn't say. He wanted answers, but wasn't going to press the question. Not now. So they drank wine and stared at their food, the wall, the ceiling fan. There was no mention of anything from their past life. When they did let out a word, it was about the weather. Unseasonably warm today, isn't it? Fred said. John couldn't help but notice how good Annette looked especially compared to him. Prison had been rough on him, and his face was lined, his hair gray. Annette looked like she was still 30, her red hair shiny and full, her face wrinkle-free. John wondered if she had Botox given the lack of lines in her forehead. As dinner ended, John suggested they take a walk outside. Annette and Fred agreed, and the three of them stepped out into the night air. The moon cast a pale glow over the landscape. John led the way, taking him down a path that wound through the woods. Annette shivered. It's chilly out here, she said. John smiled. Don't worry, we'll warm up soon enough. They came to a clearing, and John turned to face them. I have a surprise for you, he said. Annette and Fred exchanged a look. What kind of surprise? Fred asked. John gestured towards a freshly dug hole in the ground. I thought we could all bury the hatchet, he said, and bury something else, too. Annette gasped. What are you talking about, John? John's smile turned sinister. I'm talking about burying the two of you alive. Fred took a step back, but John was quicker. He lunged at them, grabbing Annette by the arm and pulling her towards the hole. Fred tried to intervene, but John hit him with the shovel, knocking him to the ground. Primal feelings took over, the same one John experienced when he saw his wife having an affair. As Annette scooted back on her butt in the dirt, screaming, John bashed Fred's head again and again with the shovel blade. The blood sprayed across John's face, painting it in shades of scarlet as he relentlessly bashed the shovel into Fred's skull. The sickening thud of metal meeting bone echoed throughout the woods like the sound of a butcher cleaving meat. Flecks of brain and skull fragments sprayed everywhere, coating the ground with a gory sheen. John's eyes burned with a wild, crazed intensity as he continued his brutal assault, lost to the bloodlust that had overtaken him. He was no longer a man, but a monster driven by a primal urge to destroy. Annette watched in horror as John rained blow after blow onto Fred's shattered skull. She tried to scream, but her voice was frozen in her throat. Her body trembled uncontrollably, as if it knew instinctively that in the presence of someone so unspeakably evil, that if she moved one inch, she would be next. And still, John didn't stop. He pounded the shovel into Fred's face with a relentless fury until there was nothing left but a pile of bloody, unrecognizable fragments. With a grunt, he shoved Fred's lifeless body into the gaping hole he had dug in the forest floor. John's chest heaved with exertion, and his breath came in ragged gasps as he tried to control the boiling rage that simmered within him. This wasn't how things were supposed to go down. John thought bitterly. It wasn't supposed to be this messy. He had planned every detail of this night. He had rehearsed it over and over in his mind when he was locked up. Annette's hand snapped a twig and John turned his attention to her. He licked his lips, his mouth twisting into a cruel smile. There she was, John thought, that nasty piece of work. That two-time and dirty, rotten bitch who played him like a fool. But he wasn't going to let her get away with it. 
Oh, no. John had something special planned for her. Something that would make her pay for all the lies and deceit. One last vital piece of business that needed to be taken care of before he could finally rest. John clenched his fist, the tendon standing out like cords. The night was dark and cold, but he didn't feel it. His blood was too hot, too alive with the promise of vengeance. And he would stop at nothing until his mission was complete. He grabbed Annette by the hair and dragged her to the garage. He threw her onto the concrete floor and locked the door behind him. It was time to make her suffer. He turned on the lights, revealing a room full of tools and torture devices, a syringe, different types of knives and scalpels, a power drill, a hacksaw, ropes and pulleys, a jigsaw. Annette's eyes widened in terror when she realized what he had in store for her. She tried to scream, but he gagged her, muffling her cries for help, and strapped her to a table. John approached with the sinister smile on his face. You should have never cheated on me, Annette. Now you're going to pay the price, he said, his voice cold and menacing. He picked up the scalpel and pressed it against her skin, tracing a line across her cheek. Annette whimpered, tears streamed down her face. John laughed, relishing in her pain. He made the first incision, slicing into her skin with expert precision. She screamed in agony, but he didn't stop. He continued to cut, digging deeper and deeper into her flesh. You deserve this, he said. You deserve to suffer. As he inflicted his torture, John felt a sick sense of satisfaction. He was finally in control, finally getting revenge for all the pain she had caused him. Annette's arm hung limp, the skin peeling away like old damp wallpaper. Blood oozed from the wound, staining the table beneath her. John knew what he was doing. He avoided any major veins to ensure she didn't bleed out too quickly. As Annette struggled in pain, struggled against her restraints, her eyes fell upon a tray next to the table. It held a vial of clear liquid and a syringe that looked like it could have been used on a horse. The fear in her heart grew as she realized that John had more than just murderous revenge in his mind. What was in the vial... What kind of monster was she dealing with? This wasn't the person she knew. This wasn't John. Despite the blood loss and the pain, Annette knew she had to fight. She had to get back to her kids before John could find and harm them. As John leaned in, Annette closed her eyes, reared her head back, and headbutted him with all her might. The crack of skull on skull thundered throughout the garage. For a moment, everything went black as stars exploded in her vision. When her senses returned, she saw that John was dazed and disoriented. But it wasn't enough. She had to strike again. Without hesitation, she sank her teeth into his face, tearing away a chunk of his cheek in a spray of blood. John's scream mingled with the metallic clang of the scalpel as it flew from his grasp. With her hands slick with blood, Annette fought against the restraints that bound her, desperation giving her strength. She managed to loosen them enough to free herself, and with a powerful kick, she sent John sprawling to the floor. Without looking back, she ran as fast as she could towards the door, her heart pounding with fear and adrenaline. She had to get out of there, get away from John. With a guttural roar, John charged Annette from behind, catching her off guard as he tackled her to the ground with a thud. They wrestled on the floor, punching and clawing at each other, their blood intermingling. Annette managed to grab a hammer nearby and swung it at John's head, hitting him with a sickening thud. He fell to the ground, dazed but not totally out of it. Annette knew she had to keep fighting if she wanted to survive. 
She grabbed a pair of needle nose pliers and used them to stab John in the chest. He screamed in pain, but he wouldn't relent. He grabbed a nearby wrench and swung it at her head, swinging wildly. Annette ducked, causing the wrench to hit the concrete wall behind her. As John stumbled in pain, she ran out the door, leaving him behind. Annette tripped her way through the dark, tangled woods, her eyes wild with fear and pain. Her clothes were torn, her body was bloodied, and her heart pounded with the desperate need to escape John's grasp. She could hear his heavy breathing and the crunch of leaves as he closed in on her. She tried to run, but her legs felt like lead weights, and she knew she couldn't keep going for much longer. Come back here, you bitch! John yelled. I got a present for you! Annette stumbled over a root and fell to the ground, scraping her palms and knees on the rough forest floor. She scrambled back up, her eyes darting around frantically for any sign of help. And that's when she saw it, a faint glimmer in the distance. It was a flashlight, moving steadily closer. Oh, oh, please, God, help me, please, help! Annette cried out, her words catching in her throat as she stumbled towards the light. As she broke through the trees, she saw a group of hikers huddled around a small campfire. They jumped up in shock as she stumbled towards them, her face twisted in agony. But please you have to help. He's coming, Annette gasped. Who's coming? What's going on here? One of the campers asked. John, Annette breathed, her eyes wide in terror. He's going to kill me. The flathead screwdriver pierced through Annette's neck with a sickening crunch, blood spraying out in a violent eruption. It was as if Fourth of July fireworks had come early and Annette was the star of the show. Told you, you pay bitch, a bloody John said as he emerged from behind her, his breathing ragged and labored. The pliers were still in his chest, a gruesome testament to the struggle that had taken place between the two of them. The campers, who had been enjoying a peaceful night in the woods, screamed and scattered in all directions at the sight of John. His face was a mask of red, a gash on his forehead oozing blood down his face like a crimson river. The, the kids! Annette's words were barely audible, a faint whisper amid the chaos. They... John leaned in close, his eyes glimmering with maniacal light. What about the kids, Annette? What'd you do with them? Annette gasped for air. Her eyes flickered with fear and pain. I, I hid, I hid them in the, in the cabin. John's expression twisted into a savage snarl. You think you can outsmart me? You think you can keep our children away from me? With a primal roar, John plunged the screwdriver deeper into Annette's neck, silencing her forever. The campers watched in horror as John stood up, his chest heaving with rage and triumph. As John stumbled back to the cabin, his wounded body aching with every step, he knew what was waiting for him. The police, with their flashing lights and stern expressions, had come to take him away. He could see them waiting in the distance, their handcuffs glinting in the moonlight like a pair of sinister eyes. As he got closer, John saw his children huddled together, tears streaming down their faces. They had been through this before, this pain of seeing their father taken away in chains. John wanted to hold them, to tell them it would be okay, but the police wouldn't even let him speak to them. All he could do was stare at their faces, trying to imprint every detail in his mind. Amy and Paul his beautiful children, now alone in this world. They would be 16 and 14 now, he thought. Their faces looked healthy and strong, like their mother. As John was led away in handcuffs, he broke down crying. If only he had followed through on the promise to reconcile with Annette, he could have been with his children. Now, they were orphans. As he was driven to the police station, 
John knew that he wouldn't be getting paroled again. This was the end of the line for him, a life behind bars, haunted by the memories of what he had lost and what he could never get back.